I'm Aaron Sagers, and this is Talking Strange. spooky nerds and welcome to talking strange paranormal pop culture show with the den of geek network of course available on apple podcasts spotify and youtube i'm your host journalist author researcher of weird things aaron sagers you can also catch me as host of the netflix series 28 days haunted and on the travel channel discovery plus show paranormal caught on camera now my guest today ufo aficionados know my guest as the son of j allen hynek the father of ufology the astronomer who was the scientific advisor to the u.s air force's ufo studies projects uh three of them in fact from 1940s to 1960s project sign project grudge project blue book most famously or infamously depending on how you look at it however Paul Hynek was also involved in the making of Avatar, Lord of the Rings, Planet of the Apes, 1010, Real Steel, Warcraft, The Hobbit, Halo, Call of Duty, a lot of other movies and games. He was a consultant on the History Network show's Project Blue Book, which was a fictionalized adaptation of his father's cases. And that, of course, starred Aidan Gillen from Game of Thrones as Hynek. And Paul Hynek also happens to be an accomplished author and entrepreneur in his own right. He's a Wharton MBA, an adjunct professor of finance and accounting at Pepperdine University. And he will be appearing at the UFO conference, Contact in the Desert. And that is actually just right around the corner. It's happening June 2nd to 4th, 2023 in Indian Wells, California. So let's bring him in, Paul Hynek. Hey, thanks for joining me today, Paul. Hi, Aaron. Pleasure. I'm I'm so very excited to talk to you about so many things because, of course, we have all the stuff about your dad and then just some pop culture nerd stuff that we could talk about as well. Uh, there's a lot of ground to cover. But the first thing that I, I wanted to ask is because your father, a lot of people know him as the father of ufology, as I said, but... He was an astronomer, but he was also an academic. He was a yeah. professor, and you are an adjunct professor as well. So this is maybe perhaps a bit obtuse to start with, but how are you as a professor compared to your father, and did you borrow anything from his approach? Ah, uh, yeah. So my father was the quintessential avuncular professor. Um, one of the things I remember in seeing him speak and teach was that he was just very much at ease. Um, you know, there's, um, people get very nervous public speaking, uh, and that's fine. Right. And, and I think the trick is to convert most of that energy into sort of adrenaline and, and, and go for it. And when you get self-conscious, that's when you kind of lose the audience. Right. I mean, I, I've, I've done a lot of presentations and speeches and it's only maybe three or four times where I walked off the stage saying I had done a perfect job, not objectively perfect, but the best I could do. Uh, But it just doesn't matter. People just want to see passion. They want to see something interesting. And most of the time they're thinking about, do they have enough lasagna at home for dinner? And when is this guy going to finish? So it takes the load off. But my dad was he had great command of the subject, whether it's UFOs or astronomy. And he was just had this, he was very charismatic. So um, one of the things I learned from him was, you know, he taught graduate students and undergrads alike. <clears throat> and one of his classes was highlights of astronomy, which is a beginning survey course. And his philosophy was, don't make them memorize a bunch of stuff, but teach them things they'll remember for more than five years. So when I started teaching my survey class in overall business, I had the same philosophy and it worked out pretty well. So I have to tip my hat to the old man for that. Yeah. Uh, Just a a side note for those that are not watching the video and are instead listening to this as a podcast right now, Paul has his own companion wrapped around his neck, uh, a, Beautiful little cat. What is your cat's name? This is JJ. He's uh, the most friendly, affectionate cat in the history of the world. He, he looks very affectionate. So, yeah, you know, I've I've been fortunate. I've spent a lot of time in academia, uh, both t- 
teaching and and mm. earning some some degrees and for me the teachers the professors that stuck with me going back to even middle school mr c to uh, uh professor campbell when i'm in undergrad teachers that always had that authenticity that they they were not saying that they had all the answers but there was that authenticity and that genuine excitement and excitement to share that information. I think that that's something that your father even conveyed when he started doing the media tours and was, and you know, once he was sort of out of the, the control under the thumb of, of the air force, we could really kind of pick up on that authenticity mm -hmm. and that likability. Correct. I mean, am I wrong? Yeah, I think so. Um, and you know, also in speaking, you have to roll the punches. And I remember, my father gave a speech in Winnipeg, uh, in Canada, and I think he forgot his materials. But whatever the case was, he walked up to the lectern uh, for like a one-hour talk and said, UFOs are very interesting. I shall now take questions. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> well, I'm sure, I bet he, he still filled that entire time with some Yes, questions. yes. <laughs> yeah, I, what I was just kind of, uh, updating myself on your father, I did notice that he, he, born in 1910, passed away in 1986, the years of Haley's comment or Halley's That's comment. Right. That's right. And another man, uh, Mark Twain, born in a year right. of Haley's comment, 1835, and passed away the same year that your father was born, which right. is just mind blowing in of itself. <laughs> yeah. These, th there's these synchronicities. Did your father? Was it, did he think about that? Did he think about the Haley's Comet connection? Did he think about Mark Twain? Did he think about synchronicities? Yeah, apparently he, he predicted he would go out with Halley's Comet as well. And <clears throat> when he was essentially dying, um, I was living with him and my mom in Scottsdale, Arizona, and I took him out to see Halley's Comet. And so for our family, it was um, kind of a you know comforting bookend that seemed to make a little bit of sense. And per his wishes, his five kids got together <clears throat> in, um, in the lake or on the lake where we have a, a summer cabin in Canada and we spread his ashes just in the lake. And when we're done, we look up and we see a rainbow. We thought, well, that's kind of nice. Fast forward 10 years, we're doing the same thing with my mom's ashes. Um, you know, very somber occasion. And we look up, we see a rainbow again. We thought, oh, that's nice. Then a few seconds later, we look up and we see a double rainbow. So well, that's just perfect. And we go back to the cabin and some of the next generation of kids are there. And one of them comes running up to us and says, hey, everybody, look, I found a picture that I drew of Mimi from a couple years ago with a rainbow. So just a really, you know, when you come from an astronomical family, if you have these sort of astronomical signs and indicators, it just makes things a bit easier. Yeah. Yeah. It, it almost speaks to the poetry of the cosmos that it's not mm -hmm. always about answers, but it's about, you know, sometimes seeing these patterns. Yeah, that's right. Uh, patterns over answers. Yeah. The, I, I, I'm, I'm also, I come from a family of five kids. I'm the baby of five kids. And yeah. the, I, I I'm curious if you could give me some insight what life is like growing up with this gaggle of of a big family, chaotic based on my experience, but also then you add in being this media darling and a famous ufologist. What was the average, I don't know, Monday, Tuesday afternoon in the Heineck household where you have all of that going on plus Plus all of the media attention. Uh, yeah. So, okay. So a Tuesday afternoon, let's say we've got a local news channel coming to film him for an interview. Then we go in the backyard and my brother Joel is building a jet engine in the backyard. Then uh, Travis Walton comes to dinner. That yeah. was a Tuesday. I. I, I think I had heard you mention Travis before, and I've I've had a lot of interactions with Travis throughout the years. And it's uh, he strikes me as a very sweet man. And I do find his story quite compelling. Mm -hmm. Of course, for those that are not familiar with his, his name, we we largely associated with the movie 
uh, Fire in the Sky, but his story right. is much, much more involved than than what we see in the, the Hollywood treatment. But it, it was kind of surprising to me to to hear that he would come over for dinner. Would your father often welcome in experiencers uh, or was it just Travis was a friend? Uh, well, you know, and it's like in my life too, the line between, you know, I don't know if my father would call a UFO experiencer a professional colleague, which I guess technically that's what they would be. Uh, and for me in my life, there's a pretty blurry line between people that I might consider colleagues and friends. Right. So uh, he, he was just a fellow soul, I, I think my father would think of him. Um, I also remember Father Gill coming to that to the house for dinner. He had a sighting, I think, in 1951 in Papua New Guinea. It was very interesting. Where there's a, he's inside preparing for evening prayers, and he hears a commotion outside. There's several hundred New Guineans outside. He looks up and he sees a craft floating in the sky, and he immediately does some trigonometry to figure out how far it is, etc. Which I thought was, you know, really amazing to have that sort of composure at that moment. And they're looking at the craft and this sort of hatch opens up and they see a humanoid and Father Gill waves and the humanoid waves back. And there's there more to the story, but I thought that was fascinating. And so he was in Chicago where we were living for a religious ecumenical conference, not on a book tour or anything like that. And uh, he knew my father pretty well, so he came for dinner. Well, you know, the kind of quid pro quo is if you're going to eat our food, you're going to have to talk about your sighting, right? Yeah. And one of the things my father was impressed by was that he was very smart, and, and I could see this with him. He was very intelligent. He was comfortable in his skin. He was consistent over the years with his account. He had nothing whatsoever to gain from it, and he just told it in a very matter-of-fact way, and he was just a what my father would call a very a highly credible witness. Yeah. Well, I know that your family wasn't religious and I, I was particularly, I was raised Catholic, but I don't yeah. really, I'm not observant these days. It's more cultural. And right. did, did your father and you, <laughs> did you have conversations or thoughts about how, whatever is going on with these sightings, whatever UFO, UAP, you know, flying saucers, as we call them back in the day, whatever they are, wherever they come from, did you ever come have a conversation about how that impacts religion, <laughs> religious belief, and also let's face it, religious oh. organizations uh, globally, what that situation would be like if there was some sort of disclosure or, or whatever we want to call it. <clears throat> Sorry for the coughs. I'm getting over a case of COVID. Oh. Um, my father had Rosicrucian leanings. Um, and my mother had been raised Methodist but didn't like it. So our household <coughs> had really no religion at all. Um, no criticisms, no adulation. It just wasn't present. Um, and we would talk about all sorts of things. It was a very open atmosphere and, and and you know people know my father for ufos but he like you said was an academic and a scientist and that's how we saw him who happened to have a late in life side hustle of ufos so we talk about all kinds of things scientific method and and exploring etc i don't remember specifically talking about how some type of ufo disclosure might you know, upend the apple cart of organized religion. Um, you know, my father had his share of frustrations with Project Blue Book, which you, I think, aptly referred to as infamous. Um, so although he was, uh, I would say, you know, in those days it was a little bit different, but he was, he was a patriotic American, um, but he had a, a fair amount of distrust and disdain for large organizations in general. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and it's it's a it's a topic that fascinates me because even though I don't dismiss people's beliefs, I also understand. I mean, going back to Copernicus and Galileo, that when yeah. when a scientist comes along and proposes a theory, if it doesn't fit within the religious mold or organization, that person is often treated as a crackpot or thrown in jail, and uh, it doesn't seem like we're necessarily 
totally removed from that time. <laughs> yeah, those are two particular heroes of my father as well. Oh, I did not know that. That's great. Well, <laughs> yeah, uh, he knew how to pick them. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. was he when the close when Close Encounters comes along and he's serving as a consultant and then also appears on screen? Mm -hmm. Was he? I realize perhaps sees the importance of doing this, but was he a fan of pop culture himself? I loved the Muppets and Monty Python uh, and Rock and Bullwinkle. Um, you know, he was he was a little bit hesitant about the movie because when you're dealing with kind of a fringe science and Hollywood comes along, it doesn't all, always treat it with sort of um, a respectful manner. But um, he became very comfortable with, with Steven Spielberg's approach and with the movie overall. And I met Spielberg during filming of the, the movie and he thought it was great. He thought it was uh, a, a nice way to look at aliens as not necessarily evil, right? I mean, they, they, they kidnapped, right? I mean, technically, but the people didn't seem to begrudge them much. They were just kind of like, uh, uh, it seemed like no time had transpired. They were just sort of dizzy, but it was a nice representation, not only of aliens as not evil, but also, sort of along the lines of the title of his first book is The UFO Experience. It's not the UFO sighting, right? Um, because, you know, we call them experiencers because there's often so much more to what a witness will recount than just seeing some craft in the sky. All sorts of communication that may take place beforehand, like in the movie, during or after the experience. And I think my father uh, was gratified that the movie was um, good and sort of made it more comfortable for a lot of people to come forward and say, hey, I've had something that happened and I can't explain it. And indeed, a lot of things that happened in the movie were culled from actual UFO reports. Yeah. You were, you, uh, well, wait, hold on. You, your father was a big fan of the Muppets. So who was your father's favorite Muppet or what, or, or, <laughs> or favorite Monty Python sketch? Because I've never heard either of those tidbits before about your dad. Oh. Well, I think you like the two old guys who was all who are always kvetching and the Muppets. Waldorf and <laughs> um, Statler. Yeah, right. Um, for Monty Python, it may have been the Norwegian blue parrot, um, who yeah. you know, storekeeper saying is pining for the fields, and he's he's obviously dead and nailed to the perch. <laughs> I, I mean, they. What blows me away about Monty Python is I've had the opportunity to meet some of those folks, and I'm oh. and I'm I'm a big fan Heroes of what they did. Yeah. What's that? Heroes of mine. Oh yeah, and and so smart that those guys were academics. A lot of them, and you know, in the life of Brian, where we have the whole scene about <laughs> uh, you're you're not conjugating your Latin correctly. How everything was yeah. actually what he was, what John Cleese was doing was actually accurately critiquing them. The intelligence behind that <laughs> still impresses me. Yeah. <laughs> um, but well, for you, you were. Late twenties, early twenty, or, or late teens, early twenties, when Close Encounters was filming. Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> about uh, fourteen. Okay, fourteen. Okay, so when you, young Paul Heineck, get a chance to interact with Spielberg, I mean, you're probably used to you. Okay, Dad does the UFO stuff, but if you get a chance to talk to a Spielberg, what did you ask him? What was the moment like for you personally? <clears throat> I don't remember if I asked him. I, I was just kind of angry because my mom had asked me a couple weeks ago if I wanted to meet him. I said, sure. And, and you know, at that time, he wasn't well known. He had right. done Jaws and Duel, maybe a couple other things. But he was, you know, on the come. He was a rising director. But I don't think most people on the street knew who he was. And I, I hadn't really heard of him. And so my mom asked him, you want to meet him a couple weeks? He's going to be at the airport with your dad. And I said, sure. Then that day came. I said, I don't want to go. And my mom said, you said you're going, you go. So I was in a bad mood. And, you know, it's O'Hare Airport is like 45 minutes from the house. I didn't want to go there. <clears throat> but I got there, and I, I don't really remember much about it. But I, I thought it was kind of fun. He was nice. Um, but then what I do remember is when I was working on Tintin, uh, we were doing visual effects, a company called Giant Studios that does motion capture. Mm -hmm. um, and that was – shortly after the movie Wolverine had been leaked. So all movies had a lot more sort of uh, security. I had a name badge with my picture and my name on it. 
I'm walking down the hallway and Michael Kahn, who is Steven Spielberg's longtime editor, is walking down the hallway, sees my name and says, Heineck, Heineck, are you related to J. Allen Heineck? I said, yeah, it's my father. And he said, oh, he was a wonderful guy. And I'm thinking, wow, in what world does the editor of a movie interact with the technical advisor? That's just, there's different worlds. He said, your father was wonderful. Does Stephen know you're here? This was a Friday afternoon. I said, I, I really don't know if he knows of my whereabouts. So Monday morning, I get a call, Paul Heineck to the set. Because I wasn't on the set so much. I was more on the business end. And there's Steven Spielberg and Kathy Kennedy, his longtime producing partner. And her, I worked with her sister, Connie Kennedy, for, for years. And they were, we had a great time. We talked for about an hour. Um, Stephen loved my father. And Kathy said that it was Close Encounters that got her into movies. And I said, hey, um, my brother Joel's in town. Can I bring him back later today? They said, sure. And that was interesting because Joel won an Oscar for What Dreams May Come. Right. And... He's, um, you know, kind of a shy engineer type. And, you know, that's a pretty big stage, right? And so he said, he always told us that he's up on stage and he's nervous. He looks down and he sees Spielberg smiling at him. And that really is kind of, sort of grounded him. And so when we were talking later that afternoon, Joel says, hey, Stephen, I got to ask you, when I won my Oscar, you were smiling at me. Did you know who I was? And he said, of course I did, Joel. I was very happy for you. That's that's delightful. and. The and I think it, it kind of based on the interviews I've seen with Spielberg and talking about Close Encounters and then when he talks about your father, it seems like there is a there was a sincere uh, affection there. Yeah. And just yes, I know that your brother is in the movie business. I know you've done a lot of stuff within movies. Yeah. What was the connection there? Is it just some sort of was it Close Encounters that made you want to pursue? To, to be involved in movies and your brother Joel, or how did two Heineks end up in the biz? Yeah, so my brother Joel always wanted to, to be in visual effects, and he still is now to this day. Um, I was living in Japan, and Joel said, Paul, you should be a movie producer. I, I don't know if that's a compliment or not. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll move to California. Um, and after I decided that, uh, a guy approached me and asked me to start up his the U.S. branch of his Japanese software company. And by that point, I'd already gotten into tech. I'm really a nerd at heart. And so I did that. And then, you know, if you're in L.A., there are just so many entertainment things going on. And a friend of mine uh, introduced me to Giant Studios, which does you know did motion capture and all those movies that you mentioned. And I thought it was great because I, I don't – really have a burning desire to be in entertainment, but I like technology. And so technology and entertainment, I've got a long track record with, and that's one of my sweet spots. Mm -hmm. So I, I like doing that quite a lot. And uh, worked with Joel a little bit on some projects, but we were usually doing different things. Um, but, you know, he's the technical wizard. Um, I think he's the best visual effects supervisor of all time. And I think you know, if a little brother can boast, I think he made the most iconic visual effect in all of cinema history, which is bullet time in the matrix. I did not know that that was his. Uh, yeah. He's not credited because he, he created that and some other of the visual effects on the movie. And his company said, okay, Joel, you figured this out. There's another movie that we really need you to work on. Can you shift over to that? So John Gaeta, his assistant won the Oscar for the matrix. Yeah. Uh, but the other movie is What Dreams May Come, for which Joel won an, won an Oscar. Yeah. What well, What would your dad say about two of his boys doing the movie business? Would Would he say that he saw it all along? Uh, saw you guys going down this path, or or would he be amused by it? What What would his thoughts be? Well, uh, you know, I think he was still around when Joel was working on movies, and I think he thought that was great. He, you know movies that wasn't that wasn't his world um you now he's a scientist um but joel was very good at it so i think he quite liked that i had not done any entertainment things by the time he passed away um and i think he would have been you know rather indifferent if i wanted to movies or not um i think he would say hey you know bozo he called us uh, the younger kids bozo 
you know, do what you want, do what you like. Uh, I remember I was a French major in college. You know, my sister was a fantastic nurse midwife. All my brothers are engineers, very, very good engineers. My oldest brother has a PhD from MIT. Um, but, you know, again, well, not again, but engineers are essentially, you know, poor men's uh, physicists. So um, that's what I like to call them. Um, I was a French major. I remember my dad saying, French major, what kind of job are you going to get? He said, Dad, you know, college isn't about, it's not vocational school. It's not, you know, getting ready to have a job. It's about learning how to communicate and reading the classics and, you know, widening your the aperture of your intellect. And he says, but what kind of job are you going to get? So to be fair, I think if I had told my parents I was majoring in astronomy, they would have said the same thing to me. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Now, my father never really worked a day in his life because he wanted to be an astronomer from the age of seven. So it was all just gravy for him. Now, but saying, you know, as I say that, I realize he worked quite a lot of nights because that's when astronomers are active. Yeah. Um, and if you're an astronomer, one of the skills you need to develop is learning how to sleep wherever, however, and whenever you can. I, I read in your bio, you mentioned the French major. I read in your bio that uh, about putting on lectures in any language. Yeah. Are you a bit of a polyglot? Yeah. Uh, languages are a passion of mine. And um, uh, I like, I like uh, public speaking. And I just decided a while ago that um, – if when I get invited to other countries, I'll do it in their language. Um, so I've done it in Argentina. And I was supposed to do it in Italy and Bulgaria, but they both got canceled. I think lingering COVID issues. Um, when I did in Argentina, I was I was told, "Hey, look, you have an hour. We'll have an interpreter for you." And I thought, "But well, that'll cut my time in half, and really also kind of sever that connection that you develop with the audience." Mm -hmm. So I, I know some Spanish, and I realized I don't have to be fluent. I just need a really good translation. I had three different native Spanish speakers help me with it. I added in, I had to learn the Argentinian pronunciation, which is very different. And I added in some local Northern Argentina expressions. And then I just read it in a very animated fashion. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously they know I'm not a native speaker, but it was good enough that it wasn't distracting. And it just made for a much, much better experience. Um, and, you know, I, I have learned varying degrees of, of a bunch of languages. And I, I realized that whether I, and some of the languages have different alphabets. So that's a more of a challenge, like Japanese, Chinese, et cetera, and Thai. Um, so I might just write things out in English. But I, I, I feel that, yeah, I can do that with two months notice. I could do it in any language. And it shows a lot of respect for your audience. That's yeah, it just changes the tone. I remember when I went to Argentina, one of the first things I said was, uh, please excuse my Spanish. But in these ugly political days, I'd rather just not come here and open my mouth and speak English. Yeah. So as a child, yes, I mean, dinner guests might have included Travis Walton. And then part of the job involves meeting uh, Steven Spielberg on set. I understand you also interacted with both Neil Armstrong and yeah. Isaac Asimov. Uh, right. So two legends in their own right for right. very different things. Who was... Who is the more entertaining uh, dinner companion or conversationalist who, looking back, who left more of a mark on you and on your father? Well, they're both very different. Um, so what happened was in 1973, my father came to my younger brother. The three older siblings were gone. And my mom said, we're going to Africa. Like, wow. OK, great. Um, we're going on a cruise ship and we're going for free because I'll be speaking. Also um, <laughs> and we're going to go, there's going to be a full solar eclipse off the coast of Western Africa. Okay, great. Um, and we're going to spend all of our, have all of our meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner for two weeks with one other family at a table of honor. And that's Neil Armstrong and his family. So I thought, wow, that's I'm an 11 year old kid, son of an astronomer. And I'm going to spend two weeks with Neil Armstrong four years after the moon launch. I couldn't believe it. And we did. And it was, it was amazing. And I got to be friends with his kids and, uh, uh, you know, I remember, you know, people always coming up to him because he's one of the most famous people in the world. And I would say things like, Mr. Armstrong, do you want me to move them away? And, I, you know, I just was getting protective of him. And it was just fascinating. And Isaac Asimov was on the ship as well, as well as Neil deGrasse Tyson, I learned recently. Really? Yeah. Um, 
because when Neil when Neil passed away, I heard Neil deGrasse Tyson on a broadcast mentioning that he had met him on the SS Canberra, which was the cruise ship. Uh, and so I'm, I'm we're about the same age. So I'm sure we kind of played around. Um, but Isaac Asimov, I remember big old mutton chops. And these two, I don't know, 20-year-old women asked him for his autograph. He wrote, he had like a Sharpie, and he wrote on their thighs, Isaac Asimov was here. And I just thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> bit of a bit of a cad, I guess. Yes. <laughs> rogue, yes. The, and, and Armstrong, by all accounts, I don't know, I've obviously never met him, but struck me as sort of, a serious stoic person. I, I don't know yeah. if that was the reality, but did he have moments where he was speaking with your father and said, look, I kind of think there might be something out, out there too. Somehow. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, yeah, he's an engineer. Um, and in a small setting, he's, he's great. He's nice. He's personable. He's fun. He's witty. He just didn't really like the limelight that much. That just wasn't his thing. You know, not like Buzz Aldrin, right? Buzz Aldrin is a um, very outgoing, expressive guy. Neil Armstrong just wasn't like that. Um, and there's an article in the Sun newspaper out of the UK a couple of years ago that said that it was Neil who requested to sit with our family. Wow. Now, I never really thought about how it came about, but clearly if you have our families at the table, it's going to be Neil who's calling the shots, right? And he could sit with anybody. Now, um, and, it, you know, it, it wasn't that he was a fan of my father's astronomical career. Um, he was very interested in UFOs. And, indeed, he almost started a new research institute with my father after that experience. But, you know, back, especially back in the 70s, there was more stigma. And he just wasn't really that – he wasn't that comfortable being in public-facing efforts. Do you think part of it also had to do with the fact that there had to be this – uh, kindred spirit with your father insofar as working with the government, working with the Air Force and having an understanding about the peculiarities and the restrictions, something about just operating within bureaucracy that maybe uh, Neil Armstrong saw a bit of a kindred spirit with your father. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, my father was a rocket scientist. And yeah. so... Um, and, you know, perhaps could sort of paint a canvas just a little bit beyond what Neil was looking at in his sort of, you know, short horizon missions. With all these amazing experiences as a child, you're still, uh, it is in our nature as kids to rebel and at some point <laughs> reject what our parents did or what they stood for. Were there moments where you were just like, screw UFOs, I'm not into this, I hate astronomy, you could take your stars, I'm out of here, <laughs> I'm going to go smoke some weed and listen to rock and roll music. Like, were, was there a moment where you just, like, checked out of what your dad did? Uh, smoked a lot of weed, did a lot of drugs, <laughs> listened to a lot of rock and roll, had long hair, but it wasn't, It was. there was no point where... For either of my parents, did any of us say, you know, screw you, uh, you don't know what's going on. That was just how it was uh, in those days. Um, you know, kids get bored and they did drugs. Um, now, I'm very interested in psychedelics and DMT now. That's a very different issue. But it wasn't so much of a um, rebellion against them or what they stood for. And, and indeed, you know, my father was the chairman of the Department of Astronomy at Northwestern, and we grew up with Northwestern faculty families. And at one point, they got together because all of us kids were starting to do drugs, and they're all concerned. And they got together, and they said, well, look, we don't think we can just stop them by fiat. So maybe we just let them do it, take away that taboo factor, and hopefully they grow out of it. So they decided to do that, this sort of conclave of parents. And then they said, well, where would they do it? They need a safe place. And my family, my parents said, well, they could do it in the basement of our house. So we did. And so now, we, you know, um, we just went whole hog. And my father would come down and there's a party going on and people get really nervous. And I'd say, hey, dad, who's your favorite Ramon? He goes, well, Joey, of course, because that was his name as a kid growing up. Um, or my mom would say, now, whose bong is that? That's a lovely bong. Paul, you should get one like that. And so 
Um, and it worked because my younger brother and I, we, we did a lot of drugs for a long time, but we just got tired of it. And we sort of worked our way through it. I just wish I could travel back in time to be a fly on the wall to watch uh, Mr. and Mrs. Hynek talking about the Ramones and Bones <laughs> and your father talking about Joey Ramone. <laughs> yeah, man, we smoked pot with them. We were building a, a cabin in, in Canada and we're just passing a joiner on. They took hits on it. They, you know, back then it was kind of ragweed. It wasn't very strong. So they just said, eh, what's the big deal? Yeah. Are you, I, I want to, I do want to talk about uh, psychedelics in a moment, but sure. I know that you, I, I've heard that your father had an interest in the occult. Uh, yeah. And I, I believe that that's something that you share. Did you engage in conversation about the idea of ghosts or, and, and psychic <laughs> phenomena? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a guy named Harold Sherman who's a well known psychic. Um, and he used to host ESP conferences. And my father took me to those three years in a row. Um, because as a kid, I was always the most interested in UFOs and, and psychic stuff. I just found it fascinating. And I remember going to those and something interesting recently. So one of the guys who was there is a guy named Robert Monroe, who wrote several books, the first of them called Journeys Out of the Body. He was a, a radio engineer who just started you know, claiming that he left his body. I thought it was fascinating. And I met him at one of these conferences and I was thrilled because I read his book and I thought he was fascinating. And, you know, I was one of the speaker's kids. So I'm in like the green, it wasn't really a green room, but it's you know a room where the speakers get together, which they usually have at conferences. And so I had free access to everybody. And I remember talking to him thinking, look, this guy, like my feeling about Father Gill, he's, he's very intelligent. He's comfortable in his own skin. He's consistent with his accounts. He just, it just doesn't seem like, I, I, it seems like he believes this happened. And that's as far as my father would go, because somebody once asked him if the case in Pascagoula really happened. Um, and I'm, you know, friends with Calvin Parker now. Um, and my father investigated the case and he said, well, how the hell should I know? I wasn't there, but I believe the witnesses believe that it happened. And there's a lot of evidence to support that. So these conferences were great. So I met Robert Monroe and then um, fast forward a long way to this February, and I'm speaking at Conscious Life Expo here in L.A., and I see the Monroe Institute has a booth there because they do hemi-sync and binaural beats music. And I bought some CDs of theirs along the way, and I walked up to them. I said, hey, do you guys need a CFO? I could be your part-time CFO. And they said, yes, we do. So I'm now the part-time CFO for the Monroe Institute. Um, and it just worked out. The kismet worked out really well. They needed somebody. This is what I do. And the fact that I had met Bob Monroe as a kid was just an added bonus. It seems like your dad, and let me just say, like, there's people throughout my career. I've, I've had the fortune of meeting legends. Mm -hmm. I've met a lot of fascinating people. And your father is one of those people that unfortunately I was never able to meet, but he's on like that that wish list of like, if I could have, and oddly <laughs> enough, Isaac Asimov is on there too. And yeah. Because I feel like your father represented the best of what a scientist can be when interacting with the public, you know, likable, yeah. uh, sincere, willing to not necessarily say all this is real, but willing to keep an open mind and ask questions. And for that reason, it just seemed like he was the kind of person that we needed then and really need now. Oh, well, thank you. That's very kind of you to say. You know, um, my father felt, and this line is I usually attributed to Richard Feynman, but that there are two kinds of people in the world. Those who are okay with questions they can't answer, and those who are not okay with their answers being questioned. There's a neat divide between those people. And as a yeah. scientist, <clears throat> I think my father felt, like I was saying in the case of UFOs, if you come across telltale indications of something, of a phenomenon, let's say, don't be so closed-minded to dismiss it. And at some point, if, if the weight of it, the evidence suggests it, then in, embrace that and say, okay, there's something going on here. Now, that doesn't mean you need to know what it is. And I think a lot of people don't lean into UFOs or other phenomena because in the case of UFOs, they say, well, yeah, I know there's a lot of reports and the Navy says they, you know, they're concerned for the safety of their aviators and we got all these tic-tac videos and all these things so seems like something's going on 
but I just don't understand how they would get here, why they would come. And so because they can't find an answer right away, they just dismiss the whole thing. And so it's a sort of an intellectual tightrope where you say, you know, there is something going on here and I don't know what it is and I'm comfortable not knowing that. That's sometimes a, a, a discomforting intellectual perch for people. So, and, but the, uh, so I think my father felt that way and I think he kind of inculcated sort of the scientific method and that sort of openness in all of his children. Well, if you, if, if you have time, I would like you to speak a little bit about your use, your study of psychedelics, DMT, mm -hmm. and also how you view that as kind of connecting to your father's work. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, a few years ago, a friend of mine, Nova Spivak, very interesting guy who crash landed tardigrades on the moon, was having lunch with me and he said, hey, Paul, your dad, where do you think UFOs came from? I said, well, you know, he's not sure, but he and Jacques Vallée and others lean towards perhaps interdimensional for a variety of reasons. And so um, he said, oh, dude, well, then you need to read the book Alien Information Theory. I said, Alien Information Theory? It's like a sexiest sexy book title ever, yeah. right? <laughs> so I said, of course I'll read it. So I got that, and then I read And I said, what's it about? He goes, it's about DMT. I said, what's DMT? He goes, it's a super powerful psychedelic. One of the variants is ayahuasca, and it's an incredible uh, experience. So I said, sold. And then later that day, I met a, a guy who's now a good friend of mine at the same restaurant who – was introduced to me because somebody said I could help him get his movie made. And he's talking about things. And he said, oh, and by the way, I, I facilitate DMT experience. Like, what? I, I just learned what DMT is. And now you're telling me you do it. He goes, I have some here. You want to do it now? I'm like, whoa, holy crap. So I, I can't today. I'm leaving on vacation tomorrow. But I did it, start doing a couple weeks later. And you know, I read another book called The Spirit Molecule by Rick Strassman. And I was struck by how, and he did a lot of case studies, sort of like the, the, sort of teasing out some of the emergent patterns sort of echoed the early days of modern ufology. And, you know, uh, Alien Information Theory by Andrew Gallimore talks about how his theory is that DMT in particular is not a hallucinogenic, but is a different filter for your brain to actually perceive a, a different but very real reality. So, and he, he sort of likened it to aliens. And so I thought, well, that's interesting. So I haven't had a UFO experience per se, but let me try DMT. So I did, blasted off in the other realm, and I didn't see incarnations of machine elves like Terrence McKenna talks about, but I did feel like millions of miles of neurons and synapses. And I, I said, hey, thanks for having me. You know, you got to be polite. Um, and are you what we perceive to be behind UFOs and aliens. And I felt all this rumbling in the synapses and the answer came down to me. We can't explain in a way that you would understand. And it wasn't a pat or condescending tone. And I thought, wow, okay. <clears throat> Cause I was just doing this for the team, right? I'm just doing this for science. And I thought I'm on to something here. This is really fascinating. And then I, and I thought, well, if there is a link between like DMT machine elves and aliens and ghosts and all that, I can easily imagine how that link would just be beyond my ability to comprehend it. Um, it's one thing to say, oh, they're linked, but uh, the actual causal mechanism or, you know, physical connective tissue, I don't know. So I've been doing it more, reading about it. <clears throat> and then I, um, I'm speaking several times and on panels at Contact in the Desert, which you mentioned. But then I, I presented to the organizers who are now friends of mine. Hey, you know, Andrew Gallimore, who wrote Alien Information Theory, he's going to be at the conference. He's a fascinating guy. I'm interested in UFOs going towards DMT. He's interested in DMT going towards UFOs. How about he and I do a conversation on stage? And they said, great. So now we're doing that. So I'm going to have a lot of time to talk to Andrew Gallimore, somebody I, I quite admire. Yeah, I 
so I, you know, I, I deal with stuff in the paranormal realm as far as I, I research a lot of like folklore connected to ghosts, but I also mm. am quite fascinated with um, UFOs and aliens. And I feel like these terms, these phrases, aliens, UFOs, ghosts, it's all somewhat limited. It's like we're putting these big topics under these yeah. very limited words. And when you start peeling back layers and comparing cultural stories they all start aligning in a very big way and i know your father uh, it seemed like he was open to the idea of like this being an the phenomena being interdimensional correct absolutely absolutely <clears throat> there's a, a video clip that my friend paula harris sent me of him saying just that do you think that uh, on your own trips have you experienced something that seems familiar that maybe we might call a ghost, but might be, I don't know, connected to your father? <clears throat> yes. So I was with my ex-wife in our apartment and we're watching a movie on the couch. We had two cats and all of a sudden both of their heads go locked looking at something on the balcony and then just slowly sweep the room as if they're staring at something hair goes up on the back of our necks and we can see this happening and then uh my wife says okay oh that's it i'm in she walked over to the bedroom and i'm just saying well i want to see what's going on here <clears throat> and i i felt a presence and you know, I'm seeing the cats and having two of them do the same thing was interesting, right? Um, and then suddenly I felt that there was a form, a life form there, and its essence drained out as if water leaking out. And then it's gone. And I went, in, and that's all I felt, but I went in the bedroom, I talked to my wife, and she said, I think that was your father. So that's the feeling that she had. That's and I, I told my father many times, hey, you got to you got to talk to me beyond the grave. You got to give me a sign. Um, that's the closest I came to that. It's, a, it's an interesting thought that your father, who was not just a scientist, but a science educator operating with the public, that. What if in some form he is essentially able to still do that, what, either working with other intelligences or yeah. I don't know, I. Uh, I like to think that maybe that form, that energy is still around somehow. Yeah, you know, I don't I don't know about afterlife, but I sure hope so. I'm I'm careful to believe things I want to be true. Right. Um, but to me it just feels like if your soul or whatever you want to call it survives after a physical death, then it's, it just feels like it's a matter of frequency. Your soul would go where it, the frequency attracts it. No, yeah. you know, third party making some judgment. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I certainly don't have don't have the answers to it, but um, it is it's a fascinating, fascinating thought. But uh, and and I guess just finally, uh, also with regards to the psychedelics, like, I mean, your father is known for creating the Close Encounters ranking system. Right. You're you're <laughs> establishing essentially something quite similar with the use of uh, DMT and psychedelics. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I I'm interested in the idea that. DMT and ghosts and lucid dreams and aliens may all be connected. Um, and so with many of those phenomena, there are experiencers who claim to have multiple, sometimes regular or summonable, you know, CE5 experiences with what we would call super intelligent beings. And so far in taking accounts and, random alloys to people like Neil deGrasse Tyson or Michael Shermer or Seth Shostak, both friends of mine, hasn't moved the needle for them. Uh, or, you know, star maps or admonitions that we need to knock off the nukes and do more kumbaya or, you know, Aunt Ginny has the gout, hasn't worked. So what I became interested in is, okay, well, my father came up with a very useful classification system for the types of UFO sightings but it doesn't speak to evidence and so what i'm interested in is whether or not there's a link between different phenomena but is inculcating in the various experiencer communities the idea look are you interested 
in demonstrating the objective reality of your experiences. Now, many of them will say, no, don't need to. But if you are, okay, what we've done so far largely hasn't worked. Okay. So instead of you reacting and just picking up the little bits of metal, whatever that you find, and let's proactively ask questions of these super intelligent beings such that, you know, ones that we don't think that humans could answer. Very difficult math questions. Or bring back evidence. So I've made a classification system of different categories of what we could call evidence and also classified them by sort of the strength, like how compelling they are. And it's like technological, biological, predictive of the future. Um, and perhaps the gold standard is math because it's, it's a universal language, I, I, I think, you know, intergalactic. And so if you are able to ask a question like a very difficult prime number to factor and bring back that answer, well, that's interesting. Now, you could have looked it up on your phone, for example. So to me, the most compelling of all would be if you can influence that encounter. And I can tell you, DMT encounters are not that easy for me to control. But if you can, ask them, and I, I, I'm making a kit to give people, Ask them one of these seven millennium unsolved math problems. Because if you come back with that answer, I guarantee you these skeptics will be interested. Now, they won't necessarily make the bridge, okay, you solved that, you know, the Riemann equation, so that means they're aliens. No, they'll say there is some super intelligence here that solved this, and that will make them lean into it more. So that's my... I don't really care what the government says or does. That's a whole other discussion about disclosure. I'm interested in exposure. Um, I saw my father led around by the government, so screw them. What I'm interested in is the nexus between scientists and experiencers and bridging that gap. And I think that can be done with having experiencers bring back things that speak the language of science. So I want to help them do that with a kit to furnish them with to proactively ask things that science would like to know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, what is, I don't even know what disclosure is anymore because it doesn't seem to be something led by the, the government, but right. maybe maybe spearheaded by the people if we could all just start getting our act together collectively. Uh, I know, Paul, that you will be at the Contact in the Desert event June 2nd to 4th in Indian Wells, California. For anyone that wants to follow your work otherwise or keep up with what you're doing, what is the best way to do that? Probably stalk outside my house in Calabasas, California. We don't um, want to encourage that. <laughs> yeah. I have a pretty anemic social media footprint. I'm on Twitter, but that's about it. Um, don't have a website. So I guess, yeah, Twitter. Okay. Okay. Twitter's good. What are you on Twitter? Just Paul Heineck. Okay. Easy enough. And uh, Paul, it's just been such a blast talking to you. And I appreciate hearing your stories. I appreciate hearing more about the man uh, that is your father, just truly fascinating family all around. And I feel like we could keep going on, but I'm cut you loose. So thank you so much for your Paul, for your time, Paul. And in the meanwhile, I'm Aaron Sagers. This has been Talking Strange. And if you have stories you'd like to share of the strange and unusual, email us at talkingstrange at denimgeek.com. And until next time, be kind, stay spooky, and keep it weird.